Hi guys. My name is Lori and I'm a full-time disabled student. I'm chiefly concerned with how people like me can not only find positive representations of ourselves within media, but also how these representations shape the perceptions of those around us within the gaming community as a whole. The ill are treated uselessly by the games industry at large, relegated to either gimmicks or plot devices. Characters written with illness are often crude and reductionist to generics. Representation in truth is attempted with minimal effort, barely scratching the surface of the vibrant and multifaceted experiences of people who actually live with these stories. It is with that in mind that I attempt to speak a little to the matters that my community face when it comes to our representation in games and the greater media at large. I would like to remind everyone here that my talk has triggering content. Some of the tropes have the word crippled in them, and I will be warning for body horror in advance. If you feel uncomfortable for any reason, please feel free to leave at any time. With that in mind, I'll begin. This talk will discuss the frequency and manner in which people suffering from illness are portrayed within the gaming community. I will attempt to define what a trope is and look at some of the most frequent tropes used when writing characters with illness. And briefly defining and giving examples of several common tropes, I will ask the following questions. What counts as good or bad representation of illness within gaming? Does media portrayal of ill people as stereotypes in genre works still count as representation? How do they affect our perception of people with disabilities and mental illnesses? And with all of this in mind, how can we be more conscientious of the way that we represent people affected by illness within games as a whole? So how should we define illness for the purposes of this talk? In my opinion, illness is a word intentionally brought in scope in order to encompass as many people as possible. Whether a person suffers in the long or short term, acute or chronically, psychologically or physically, they are ill. Whether people suffer from addiction, genetic disease, or developmental disorders, they've earned the right to claim illness. Policing other people's experiences, in my, in my opinion, has never been a useful parameter. Illness, therefore, can be considered any set of circumstances which become obstacles to living functionally. There should be no minimum criteria of suffering before someone is admitted to Club Ill. The World Health Organization estimated in 2014 that over 1 billion people, or 15% of the world's total population, some suffer from some form of disability. While at least 110 to 190 million adults have significant difficulties in functioning. Clearly, there are a lot of us. So why is it that when I look to media, illness is all but invisible? With the number of people living with illness in their everyday lives, why is it that companies choose to neglect our stories? Instead of very balanced portrayals of the disabled as fully realized human characters, we are represented as cliches, tropes, and plot devices. But what exactly is a trope? As TV Tropes puts it, you've seen this somewhere before. A trope can be defined, according to them, as a conceptual figure of speech, a storytelling shorthand for a concept that the audience will recognize and understand instantly. In essence, it's a literary convention. And there's nothing inherently wrong with using such a device. Certainly, not all tropes are negative in their usage nor their conception. However, when taken in their presented context and then extrapolated upon, many conventions can actively impact perception of the subjects at large, and this is where, especially for characters written with illness, tropes can become harmful. Even a basic understanding of some of the most common tropes about people with illness can enable the people affected by them to have a voice in representation discourse. Being able to point out a specific convention enables a jumping off point for people to begin discussions about conscientiousness. So what are some common tropes seen about people with illness in video games? I've included one in the name of this talk. Its name is the inspirationally disadvantaged, and it essentially means that a disabled character exists as a gimmick to make other people feel inspired. There are three main types of this trope. An ill character who does something completely normal but is heralded for it. A character who can perform even beyond the range of their counterparts in spite of their disabilities. Or a character whose very existence serves to teach other characters very special lessons or basic empathy. All of these examples are exploitative because these characters often lack their own agency except to serve or inspire others. In this way, the inspirationally disadvantaged can be used as an umbrella term when analyzing representation as a whole within the gaming community, since its very definition brings to light major issues within the medium. When people believe that illness is meant to be inspirational to them, we get things like this. Countless articles praising writers for making them feel good about themselves at the expense of the experiences those characters are based upon and the people who share them. But what about some other common tropes about illness? 
The handicapped badass is a character who's just that, a badass. In fact, they're made even more badass by the fact that they have an illness or disability. Notable examples include T.K. Baja from Borderlands, who shows no difficulty wielding a shotgun, though he's blind and missing a leg. Malik from Assassin's Creed, who, while missing his left arm, leads a group of only four assassins against an army. Tiny from Guild Wars 2, who brings herself, who builds herself a combat golem to ride in because she cannot walk due to crippling pain. And the infamous Joker from the Mass Effect series, who has no difficulty being the best dumb pilot in space, despite suffering from Vrolic Syndrome. Tiny also fits into another trope, the genius cripple. This is a character who is normally physically disabled, but who makes up for their disability by being hyper-intelligent. Tiny is an orphan child prodigy within a culture of already super-intelligent beings. Lester Crest from Grand Theft Auto V has a degenerative muscular disease, which doesn't prevent him from being the brains behind most of the heists in the game. Hugh Darrow from the original Deus Ex pioneered human augmentation, even though he himself cannot be augmented. This trope is already unrealistic enough, but it often overlaps with another, the evil cripple. This is someone who has taken their intelligence and turned it for nefarious purposes. And in the extreme worlds of video games, it often manifests itself as the Dark Lord on life support. Taking the disabled aspect of a villain into the extreme, this is a character who is either terminally ill or who relies on some sort of device to remain functional. The Fallout series is quite fond of this trope. Dr. Braun from Fallout 3 has spent the last 200 years in a life support pod, which he is dependent upon to continue to run a simulation in which he kills people for fun. Kaisar is the leader of a cult who has a crippling brain tumor in Fallout New Vegas, and in the same game it is revealed that Mr. House has prolonged his life through a life support chamber, but oversees the entire New Vegas Strip. GLaDOS from the Portal series also falls under this trope, relying on the facilities to survive and continue her experiments. Please note that the next slide contains body horror. Barrier Disabled is an especially cruel trope where a character suffering from illness is killed off in a game through a variety of means, be they suicide, natural causes, mercy killings, or graphic violence. Bren from Deus Ex Human Revolution begs the main character to kill him when he sustains major injuries because he would rather die than become augmented. David Archer is an autistic man whose brother traps him in a grotesque torture device in order to run experiments on him in the Overlord DLC of Mass Effect 2. Though the player can rescue David, they can also leave him for his brother to continue experimenting, eventually leading to a note that says that Gavin stopped David's pain. Sarah is a neuroatypical character from The Walking Dead Season 2 whose death is both graphic and unpreventable. Many fans of the series had to endure interviews where the devs openly relished in the violence of her death. Sarah as a character was 15 years old. Moving back to the idea of compensating for illness, a character with a disability superpower goes through a series of events with make up for their limitations and more. Adam Jensen, the main character from Deus Ex Human Revolution, is seriously injured in the prologue and is turned into a super soldier by his employer. Kreia from KOTOR 2 lost her sight but instead sees through the force of the Star Wars universe. Similarly, the ritualist class from the first Guild Wars game blind themselves in order to better sense the spirit world. This trope directly leads into a subtype, the blind seer. This is a character who can see supernaturally despite their lack of vision. Kreia fits this trope to a T, going so far as to predict the future during the end of the game. Orin from Final Fantasy X is the only character who is consistently aware of what is actually going on. Riku from the Kingdom Hearts series prefers to blindfold himself to better sense the darkness. In the words of a colleague of mine from this year's WizCon 39, the only thing she gained when she lost her sight was 40 pounds. This trope... <laughs> Adam Jensen also fits into another trope, we can rebuild him. This is when a character is so damaged physically that they must be completely rebuilt. In the case of Gruntilda, the villain from the Banjo-Kazooie franchise, she transfers her soul into a robotic body. Perhaps more famously is the bringing back to life of Commander Shepard, the main character in the Mass Effect series, after dying from space exposure. The eye patch of power is for a character to accentuate their prowess in battle without actually impairing their ability in any way. Sagat from Street Fighter embodies this trope as the final boss of the first game. 
The Iron Bull from Dragon Age Inquisition did actually lose vision in his eye, but it never impacts his ability to wield a great hammer. John Marston from Red Dead Redemption wears an outfit which not only gives him an eye patch, but ironically improves his close-up aim. This next slide has a body horror warning. Finally, a character with an arm cannon has had part of their body replaced with just that, a big gun. The cannibal enemies from Mass Effect 3 have a cannon arm made out of mutilated human bodies. Barrett from Final Fantasy VII decided to switch his prosthetic arm to a gun when he got permanently really pissed off. And Mega Man's signature weapon is his hand cannon, although the game justifies this by saying that he can also augment an actual hand in its place. These are only a few of the, multi the multitude of tropes that exist about people with illness, and almost any character that you can think of will fit into at least one cliché. Just because a character falls within a literary convention doesn't automatically mean that they're a bad character. In fact, some of the most well-written characters have spawned their own category of stereotype. When discussing representation of illness, the important thing is not that a trope was used, but the context in which it was used and how it impacts perception at large. So with some of these tropes in mind, how can we really say which characters count as good or bad representation? When attempting to judge the value of representation, if a character lacks their own agency, they're likely a poorly written one. And yes, this includes all background characters who are presented with illness in order to flush out gritty or realistic settings, as well as characters who only exist to foster empathy. Good examples of representation for the illness community mean characters with their own personalities, thoughts, actions, and dreams outside of their illness, but without ignoring it. In essence, fully exploring the scope and depth of human experience of someone who is ill. I'll give you some, I'll give you some examples from one company, BioWare. As mentioned earlier, the Iron Bull is physically disabled. Though this doesn't affect how badass he is, Bull is a fully fleshed out character with development and growth of his own, and the game acknowledges his past injuries as a part of him without letting them define him. Then again, David Archer exists with no agency, a man who is tortured purely because his autism is seen as scientifically miraculous. The player gains no insight into his life, needs, or wants other than through his pain. Worse still, within the first Mass Effect game alone, there are no less than eight side quests with minor characters dealing with some type of illness, the majority of which result from past traumas. In almost all of these quests, Shepard has the ability to, or is forced, to kill them. These characters literally exist to add flavor to space questing. And Bioware continues to indulge in this despicable practice despite a demonstrative ability to produce more sophisticated characters like Bull. So why is it that being treated with humanity is such a stretch goal for disabled people in gaming? When game companies write characters with illness, the treatment of those characters affects people's perception of illness as a whole. Several of these tropes perpetuate the ideals that disabled people have to have something that makes up for their disability, and that their experiences are only valid if they include a but. If they don't, then they cannot be seen to be equal to their abled counterparts. This carries over into the real world. Disabled people are expected to be able to compensate for their own limitations. This is entirely unrealistic and limits the way we view people's words to their capitalist efficiency. Respectability is not productivity, yet it is written that way in gaming. In genres defined by male power fantasies, things like the eye patch of power are especially common. There seems to be a prevailing ideology of weaponizing injuries to the point that they become almost fashionable in worlds of violent domination. In the case of tropes where ill people are written as villains, consumers are encouraged to see disabled people as violent or dangerous. In reality, people suffering from illness are at much more risk of being harmed and abused by others. Writing ill people as unpredictable and villainous further seeks to dehumanize and invalidate their experiences as something to be shunned, feared, or openly despised. In this way, gaming companies are worsening the stigma about illness in society and contributing, whether directly or indirectly, to the continuous harm of ill people. When ill people cannot define what is normal for themselves, they are never seen to be normal. And when illness is seen as monstrous, people are monstrous to the ill. Ill people are at a statistically increased vulnerability, and I'm only going to read some of the statistics here. Women with a disability are significantly more likely than abled women to experience domestic violence in their lifetime and are much more likely to have a history of unwanted sex with an intimate partner. 80% of women and 30% of men with intellectual disabilities have been sexually assaulted. 
The World Health Organization estimates that children with disabilities are 3.7 times more likely than non-disabled children to be victims of any sort of violence. Children with mental or intellectual impairments appear to be among the most vulnerable, with 4.6 times the risk of sexual violence than their non-disabled peers. Adults with mental health conditions are at nearly four times the risk of experiencing violence. With these statistics in mind, it's understandable that disabled and ill people neither want to see themselves only as inspirational nor lesser than their disabled pe or abled peers. Excuse me. We do not perform illness for the consumption or entertainment of others. And if your, girl, if your game world has to sustain itself on the suffering of disabled bodies in order to po populate a living setting, then it is a poorly written and offensive game world. Despite social Darwinist bullshit, we spend every day surviving, and harmful stereotypes only make that more difficult. Refusing to recognize the inherent value of people other than you not only hurts your game, but directly contributes to continuous issues within society. After all this, the question becomes, how can we be more conscientious in order to make better games? Although 50 to 70 percent of disabled people will be kept out of the workforce due to their limitations, we must value the richness of their lives on their own merit. It is not enough to see someone who is ill as also human. This is not a high enough bar for respectful inclusion into a space. We must strive to make games more accessible, whether that be for people with colorblindness, limited mobility, deafness, or other barriers. Sometimes this is as easy as merely allowing game settings to be altered. We must be able to encourage people of all ages to see themselves positively represented within their communities and end the cycle of two-dimensional cynical and dismissive portrayals of illness. We do have the power to do more. As Javi Gwaltney put it, if I had had numerous role models influencing not just me, but the rest of the culture I inhabit as well, telling us that disabled people were strong and intelligent and valuable, would I be as anxious and ashamed of a condition I have absolutely no control over? The games industry has a unique position compared to other industries like film and its potential to directly engage the audience in an interactive format. Therefore, with great power comes great responsibility. We owe it not just to the consumers, but to ourselves to make games which reflect the entire spectrum of the vibrancy of the human experience. We can make great strides toward improving the lives of people with illness merely through our storytelling capability. Reshaping both the views of the disabled and abled communities is within our reach. We need only make it a priority. Thank you. No. She asked me if there's anything I know of sort of like black game devs that hires disabled game devs. I do not. I, I know of none. And unfortunately, that has to do partly with the fact that a lot of disabled people are kept out of the working force. And also that on average, disabled people only make 22 cents to the white man's dollar because it's illegal to pay them less than minimum wage. I mean, it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't, oh, she asked me for positive examples of disabled people. It doesn't have to necessarily mean that a disabled person falls into no trope or cliche that's ever been conceived in order for them to be positive. I mean, I personally think that Barrett from Final Fantasy VII is a great character, despite the fact that his hand is a gun. Um, <laughs> he later, I think, in the movies, I don't, I'm not really into the Final Fantasy universe, but he does later change it back or like has an interchangeable hand in the movies or something. Um, but I mean, he's a fully fleshed out character. He has his own story, he's a father. And I think that there are other examples like that where even though a character fits into a trope, it doesn't necessarily define their existence within the game, if that makes sense. Um, unfortunately though, there's, <laughs> there's I, when I was writing the talk, I had to really reach to think about positive examples because there are hundreds more negative ones. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, cool. Thank you guys.